good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm working for an ETH spin-off, Validity Labs. It's a company that is specializing in uh, development of decentralized applications. And I will spend the next 15 minutes before your coffee break on um, the crisis in research and uh, what kind of opportunities we actually have now for uh, collaborating and making a change in that space. So the issues today were already covered pretty well, uh, such as the open science, uh, why is the science right is, uh, is not really truly open, why do we have a producibility crisis. I'm sure every one of you have their own personal uh, opinion and experience in all these spaces, like why we don't really have a fair metric also for research uh, impact, etc. So I'm not going to go through it, but um, I would like to focus on one particular issue that I think is very relevant and very important, and that is that science has actually been going through a transition in the past 30 years. So with this case of the US funding, you actually can see um, how, as a function of time, the funding was coming into R&D. Um, that includes academic and non-academic uh, research the sector and how the funding with the green line uh, was coming was federally funded that is government and uh, then the business is a blue line so you see that in the past 30 years the the funding coming from the government has been decreasing dramatically and has been overtaken by the business interest and the business input and uh, you know given that we have two types of research we have basic research and that is the one that is actually contributing most to our advancement of knowledge and uh, most groundbreaking discoveries this 50 percent of that research is being done by academia but the funding for that is extremely disproportionate so businesses tend to rather fund applied research. This is also, of course, important, but um, it's, it's not in the interest of businesses because to translate what we have in basic research, it takes about 20, 30 years to bring into the marketplace. So basic research is extremely disadvantaged. And to make matters worse, we all know that the number of papers is a function on time. This, whole, uh, this looks somewhat like this. But at the same time, the number of companies that have R&D departments uh, uh, that are publishing is actually decreasing with time. So the science and the contribution of, from them to science is being <laughs> decreasingly open year by year. So what's the natural solution to it and how can we, so, in a way, save basic research? Well, we have to force governments to put more money back into basic research and fund academics that are struggling. But this is not realistic. So social scientists and economists say that the solution to it is to align industry and academic interests, so to try to find a way that we can collaborate together. But let's not kid ourselves, right? I mean, already in the 40s, uh, people came up with uh, the concept of norms in science. So those were si uh, four principles that scientists agreed are extremely important for the science output, and that is communality. So sharing ownership of all the data as the human race that owns our scientific output. We do it for, for everybody. Um, we have univers universality, and that means that these findings should be judged based on the merit and based on their quality. We have disinterestedness, which means uh, work should be free of uh, self-interested motivation. We shouldn't be pursuing wealth, but knowledge, and skepticism. So even if we spend years on uh, our research finding, we should still be able to evaluate all the evidence, and, be, and if this evidence contradicts our body of work, we should be able to say, we were wrong. Then there are counter norms, and the counter norms are, if you look at it, and if you're still with me <laughs> at this point, they, they are much more uh, applicable to the business sector. So this is the fact that we need to protect our, um, our priority in publishing or our priority in filing a patent. It's particularism, and that means that it's a lot easier with all the you know, papers that are coming out of there. It's a lot easier to judge the quality based on the reputation, be it the reputation of a university or even a research group, rather than actually look at the quality of the, of the paper output. Uh, it's self-interestedness, because their funding is so scarce that we are finding ways to game the system, right? And we compete for funding or recognition or for money. And then dogmatism, because we spend so much time investing in uh, promoting our own work, not really 
thinking so much critically about ourselves. And th the funny thing is that social scientists were looking at these two norms and, uh, in, in scientists today, and they were finding that scientists were rather reporting that they follow themselves norms in science, but everybody else follows counter norms. So um, given that you know, business interests are driven by the, these counter norms, people are trying to um, experiment with technology and try to find t some solution that will actually resonate a lot better with norms and uh, provide the right incentives because the counter norms are driven by the wrong incentives and that's, in my opinion, scarce funding. So four blockchain characteristics which come to play, they resonate very well with norms. Just think about decentralization, the fact that you try to spread power and influence over a, a peers, over your many peers, and that fosters communality. This, this intermediation, that is if you remove the structure that with its uh, reputation you know, gives a st stamp on the paper that this is a really good work, this fosters then universality. Economic incentives, if we manage to build a system that is going to have right incentives in it and will give more power but also uh, money maybe to the researchers, we will be fostering disinterestedness. And then transparency, of course, if you open up, if you show exactly what you did step by step, by step display your entire workflow, you um, open up to scrutiny and you foster skepticism. So this is one of the uh, examples that was done by our CTO, Sebastian, and by Martin, who's co-organizing this conference. It's about a research pipeline. I don't know how well you can see it, but it consists of three parts. Number one is the acquisition of data in an experiment. Number two is, uh, um, is doing a pipeline, research pipeline analysis, and then three is interpretation. And what you can do is you can put that data onto the interplanetary, interplanetary uh, file system, then you can also notarize who did what. So you have um, on top, the first part was done by an operator, second by analyst, and third by publisher. So in this way, you can track the entire pipeline. You can actually give people credit for what they have done. Is this the right solution? Is blockchain the right solution? Everybody today who was who were speaking were saying that we, we don't know, right? So finding out will take a certain degree of experimentation. So we decided to test uh, three hypotheses, and that is number one. That the solution that we're going to find will be propagating well and is going to be sustainable. This is necessary for it to make sense, right? If we, first of all, educate people and educate them across many um, relevant key players that were mentioned before in the question session uh, about the blockchain technology, what it really can do and what it really cannot so that people don't have some puffed up expectations. And B, we need to raise awareness about issues in science. I'm sure now you, you're a very uh, educated crowd, you know about these things, but if you ask PhD students or postdocs at the department, everybody is unhappy about the situation, they would like to change, but they feel that they're alone and they have zero impact. They, they can make zero impact. If you convince them that's not the case, you can actually use use their power and use their them as resources. Now the second hypothesis is that we will find better solutions and they will be found a lot faster if we combine uh, interdisciplinary expertise of many people at the same time. And the third one is that the transition between um, the current state of the art into a new kind of scientific ecosystem will be um, a lot more effective if we do it simultaneously among a number of key players in this ecosystem. And that's what we call seeding. So the method would be what uh, we discussed also during the uh, questions, that we really, it's really important that we invite to the whole discussion librarians, funding organizations, publishers, executives, investors, policy makers, technologists, researchers, and whoever else is involved in the whole infrastructure. And they have to, at the same time, be able to, um, in this kind of de decentralized uh, way, uh, make the further step. Now we put them in Davos in February, uh, into the place that hosts an annual World Economic Forum uh, meeting. And they will be, for the first two days, first of all, to, the, discussing the whole problems and bottlenecks in the collaborative research space that we made aware of them. 
from the perspective of also not only open science but also economics of science. And then we will train them about blockchain mechanisms, governance, um, e economics and also a little bit development. Then we also show a number of uh, applications in research and industry to, so that they get a feeling like where it is applicable. And then for the next two days, they will be subdivided into groups based on their interests, where they would like to contribute the most. They will be given mentors from those areas, and they will be also given design thinking experts. And over the next two days, they will try to come up with strategies for the implementation of new blockchain-backed solutions and maybe tools. In this way, we will create new uh, ideas. Uh, people will be able to pitch those ideas on stage, and the decentralized autonomous organization that they will become a part of will be able to pick the best uh, solution in their opinion that's most actionable. And the winners will advance to the incubator. The next three months is going to be an incubator. This is our team in Zug, in the Crypto Valley in Switzerland. And we will be there, and the teams will be working with us remotely. So the whole three months will be, develop will be um, sacrificed for the development of proofs of concept. And uh, the teams will have a freedom to make uh, their commitment. So they can, if nobody, in other words, has time and wants to become, go to the next stage, we will still guarantee that it will be executed and we will build it. All of our solutions will be open sourced. That means we foster the communality principle of norms and science. And the whole point is that after this experiment, we want to push a little bit more the whole um, the whole ecosystem towards sustainable blockchain-backed networks for collaborative research or norms in science. And that means not only incentivizing collaboration and openness in science, but it also means trying to find a way to reward risky projects, to fund basic research perhaps as well, and to primarily empower the community. Because you know what, There's, the situation is so um, dramatic that research now says that the most brilliant people in the academic system that's PhD students, the very young ones, 33% of them are at the risk of the common psychiatric disorder. If that situation is not dramatic, what are we doing? So Isaac Newton has written a letter to his uh, collaborator, and actually not collaborator, his uh, opponent. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I really hope that in my lifetime, I'm gonna see that philosophy and that principle uh, being widely adopted in science. And I'm going to be here until Wednesday, um, including Wednesday, so please do come to me and ask me anything. If you want to participate in that program, sponsor, volunteer, whatever, ask me about astrophysics, because I'm an astrophysicist, uh, do that. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, are there any questions? I maybe I, I can ask one. So I, I liked, uh, I mean, in response also to the talk of Ulrich Dirnagel in the beginning, uh, I mean, I, I think the solutions in the end, also this experiment that we did with Sebastian, I mean, is very simple, right? So, I mean, how do you think this DAO will be working out? I mean, what's the idea behind? I mean, it's because there's a challenge that people may just find it overly complicated or burdensome to engage in this. Um, so actually becoming a part of the DAO is going to be extremely simple. People will do it, will walk everybody during the training through it, and uh, you will have a possibility to vote on the teams that will be pitching in the end their ideas. But it, it won't be, I don't think it's overly complicated. I think even building your own very simple DAO is basically a couple of lines of code. Uh, we will also show it on, during the steps um, on Wednesday during, during the workshops. Yes. So it's, it's a place where lots of companies are driven to in Switzerland, in Zug. It's uh, partially because uh, it's, it's a beautiful place in terms of tax <laughs> perks. Uh, it's pretty low. Um, but yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of companies go in there. It's also Ethereum, Ethereum Foundation has their um, headquarters. And uh, yeah, we... It's, it's just a place where a lot of companies are and it's booming and you basically walk into the city and you see already left and right everybody's pasting blockchain all over the town. So that's why it's, it's, it's getting this name of being a crypto valley, kind of like a Silicon Valley equivalent, but for the crypto, crypto world. 
So just uh, oh. I wonder how far are we away from um, um, a status quo where I can uh, set up my own smart contract or DAO with Lego brick-like tools. So I, I want to uh, have the benefit of what you described without having to dive into technical details like solidity, which mm -hmm. is, I hope, understandable. And, and uh, I would like to know from you, what, what do you think about this? How far are we into this direction that we have this Lego brick-like thing that we can actually do stuff? It, we're actually very close. So there are a number of projects that are trying to integrate different kinds of platforms so that you can very easily either build also your, da your DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or maybe you can inc incorporate um, a couple of tools that are not off blockchain, but you can build them together and give them kind of the backend uh, in a lot easier way, right, than being able to uh, know solidity and all the... But having said that, it's also not very tricky. Like the whole coding and the whole smart contract that you can write can be extremely simple. Um, yeah, but there's lots of projects, and I think like one of the things I to, to refer back to the conversation before, like why do we need blockchain at all? I mean, let's think about it. Like we, uh, to, in order to fix science and uh, fix these this incentives that we talked about, why s uh, even though there's been 20 years of right of uh, um, campaigning for open science, like still scientists, even though they have open access journal, they don't do it open access. It's because it's in our culture, it's because we're driven by um, very scarce uh, funding and competition. So if we could leverage the fact that there's a lot of money and a lot of attention, and a lot of people actually are very interested in the topic, if we use that momentum in order to help our, our basic research. I mean, this is, this is amazing and we should discuss it nevertheless. I know that there are equivalents like peer-to-peer, -peer, whatever, but you need to move people collectively at the same time to make a difference. So why won't we use the fact that we're just given it right now on the plate? Great, thank you very much. And maybe just to add, uh, why don't we add some science fiction to it, right, too? And so I think that's a cool way to go. And uh, with this, we are closing the session and we we'll, uh, extend the break a bit so there will be half an hour break and we will again meet here at 11.15, okay?